All right, welcome everybody uh, to this session today on what is Britain thinking and feeling. Uh, as you know, uh, statistics are a window into the soul of a nation, and so uh, we wanted to get a sense of where we are in Britain today. And who better than uh, uh, two of our sort of best uh, pollster and social research companies? Uh, so today we've got Gideon, Gideon Skinner, who's a research director at Ipsos Mori. Uh, Ipsos Mori is a, is a, a polling and research company which uh, the RSS has got a strong partnership with. We've done quite a lot of work with them this year, and I think uh, Gideon's going to be speaking to some of that work uh, today. Uh, and he's uh, leads on their political research and uh, also on their public s uh, service reform agenda. And then we've got Alison Park, uh, who is Head of Society and Social Change at NatSend Social Research. Uh, and uh, one of the areas that she leads on is the British Social Attitude Survey. Now, unfortunately, the, the, the timing of that research is that it comes out next week, I think. Uh, so uh, we may, I hope, be able to press uh, Alison for some teasers uh, as to what's going to be coming out. Uh, so uh, the format of uh, the session is going to be pretty straightforward. Gideon's going to kick off with about 20 minutes uh, of presentation and then Alison's going to follow up with a, a similar amount uh, and then we'll just uh, have, have a Q&A. So uh, over to you Gideon. Cool. It's important uh, to, to bear in mind just before I do get into the bulk of my presentation that uh, most people are not always thinking about um, great issues of national policy. In fact particularly men um, don't seem to be. This is something actually from a few years ago we asked uh, what sorts of things are you interested in and reading in your daily newspapers? And you can see the answer is sport, and TV, and more sport. Um, slightly different for women, um, but still clearly reflective of concerns around kind of you know, people's daily lives. And this is something that always cut. You know, it's always a very uh, important thing for us to tell people we're working with. You know, we're we're talking to. Uh, thousands of, of people every week in our work and it's always important for us to, to remind our clients to, to say you know, we, are, we are talking to real people they are not thinking about your issues they are thinking about the concerns that are important to them on their daily lives and so you need to kind of bear that in mind um, in terms of what I'm telling you uh, today I don't know if you can see the date this was about 20 years ago so before the kind of the advent of mass internet but I don't know whether it would be terribly different uh, if we ask this question again, maybe sort of something about looking at cute pictures of kittens or something, but I doubt it would say something massively different. Uh, but kind of let's get on to the, uh, the important issues of the day. And one of them stands up head and shoulders amongst all others, um, completely unsurprisingly, as it is across the world, uh, the economy. It's been number one on our issues index, our monthly uh, rating of the most important issues facing the country today every single month uh, since August 2008 and it's actually quite interesting if we take a long view on this that maybe the sort of the 90s the, the, the rise of new labor and um, the Blair and Brown years certainly the Blair years were were actually a bit of a uh, were an odd decade compared to if we look at our results on issues index, which we've been doing every single, or uh, well, for most months since the 70s, um, when the economy wasn't number one. Uh, you know, throughout the 70s and the 80s, it was very clearly inflation and unemployment that were dominating the public agenda. Then from the early 90s, we saw the rise of um, the NHS, we saw the rise of education, 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 of course, famously. Um, in Tony Blair's conference speech, uh, and uh, then crime coming up a little bit later in, in the 2000s. But then, as soon as the crash occurred, all of those things completely fell away, and we saw the return of the economy dominating people's views, as you can see here. What's quite interesting, though, actually over recent months, is that this very commanding lead that the economy has had over other issues has narrowed. Um, as you can see, particularly over the second order issue of, of immigration, which at the same time has been going up, and I'm going to come back to immigration later when I'm talking about some of the misperceptions that people have uh, about issues. Um, but I think that's quite interesting. It is reflective of a slightly more optimistic mood amongst the public. Um, our economic optimism index um, has increased uh, for five consecutive months, and so that's now the highest it's been since January 2010. 
Um, and I think that is in line with some of the economic news that's been coming out over the summer. So some signs that maybe the recovery is beginning to start and so people start thinking about some other issues. But it's still very clearly the economy and I certainly don't want to give the impression that people are not worried about this because we are. Um, we've uh, done a bit of global research, international research, looking at views around the impact of the, of the financial crisis and, and how it's changed people's views about the world and about the country in which they live in. Um, and we asked uh, two questions. Do you think the last five years has been good or bad for your country? And do you think as a result of the financial crash that your country will, you know, will ever be the same again? It's quite interesting just to remind ourselves that um, you know, although the story very much is dominated by what we read in the newspapers about um, the, the troubles that the Western world is experiencing, not every country is down here of, of people who are kind of really worried about what's happened and think the past five years have been um, really bad. We've got some kind of countries up here like Brazil and so on who feel a bit more positive about the way things are going. Um, as an aside though, uh, some of our latest data shows that confidence in some countries like Brazil and India and China is actually dropping a little bit over the last six to 12 months, which might be a bit worrying. But what's interesting from our point of view is where we are. And you can see there's a kind of a clear cluster of uh, Western European countries down there who think both that their country will never be the same again after the crisis, um, and that the five years has been, has been very bad for, company, for the country. We're not quite as bad as uh, Italy, Spain, um, levels of, of pessimism. Um, but we're definitely down there. It's been, a, it's been a rough few years for the public. And one of the really interesting things about that, I think, and, and maybe that um, Alison can say a bit more about this from what she's picking up from, from British Social Attitudes, is, is the impact it seems to have had on uh, maybe some of the automatic assumptions that we used to have, that things would always just get better. Uh, that our children would automatically have a better quality of life than we had. So that, you know, we've experienced a better quality of life than our parents, um, and our parents better than their parents. But that sort of automatic assumption that things will always get better, that we will have progress, um, that our standards of living will improve, seems to have taken quite a bit of a knock. And you can kind of see that here. Only three in ten think that we will emerge stronger from this recession. Over half think we'll be weaker from it for years to come, that it will have very long lasting effects. And you can see a sort of similar point in these, these two questions here. We asked, um, do you think you've been effect affected so far by the cuts? And to what extent are you worried about the cuts still to come? So around about one in three say they've been affected, they and their household have been affected you know, a fair amount by the cuts so far. Uh, and interestingly, actually, on some of the service satisfaction measures that we are monitoring, most people are still saying services, public <coughs> services, local services, schools, NHS, and so on, are broadly the same. They're not, you know, satisfaction ratings are not falling off a cliff. But what we are seeing um, is an increase in concern, an increase in pessimism about what's going to happen in the future. And you can see that there, where you can see that six in ten. Um, are worried about the impact of cuts still to come. And it may be that even that is um, too optimistic because when we ask people how many cuts do you think there have been so far, what extent of the cuts has there been so far, lots of people don't know. But the mean uh, is around about 40%. Think of, people think about 40% of the government's planned spending has been carried out so far which unfortunately is a bit of an overestimate. I mean, at the time we were doing this, IFS uh, was estimating it was about 20 odd percent. So we're worried about it. We've got some signs of uh, improving optimism, um, but very, very fragile. I think a real knock to the nation's psyche. And we, and we just also, we just don't know what to do about it. We're split on what to do about it. Um, we, we divided over what to do with our deficit problem. So we, we ask people, we try to sort of sum up the two uh, alternative approaches uh, to Britain's economic crisis. So what's our priority? Should it be tackling the deficit and keeping interest rates low? Or should we be pushing for growth 
government spending to kickstart the economy and a temporary cut in taxes. Um, and you can see that basically people are split pretty much down the, the middle. And we see that in, in other questions that we've asked as well about whether people think that spending on public services needs to be cut or not. At the moment, people really don't know what to do about it. And that maybe reflects some of the concern, um, some of the worry that is out there. They don't know which way to turn. Um, changes slightly, we, we chose these two paragraphs on purpose. We sort of put them together from speeches that George Osborne and Ed Balls had made. Um, and when we actually told people who argues each of these. So when we say George Osborne argues this, and Ed Balls argues this, um, you can see quite a different, uh, a different result. To be honest, um, that's reflective as much about just levels of, of distrust um, in the government. If we'd said, if we'd replaced George Osborne and Ed Balls with David Cameron and Ed Miliband, we'd probably have got a result going the other way. Um, but I think as much as anything, that just goes to show um, levels of distrust and, and, and scepticism that any political party has got the answer to getting us out of this uh, recession, economic crisis. So if that's, uh, that's our mood, but I, as, I, as I said, I think what's interesting and what I hope you'll, be, uh, you'll, you'll like to, to hear is some work that we've done for, for RSS that um, tries to understand on what basis is the public making some of these judgments, what is their knowledge, what is their understanding about some of these um, issues. And they're really complicated issues. I mean, you know, I get it mixed up lots of the time. Um, we ask people, do, do they know the difference between debt and deficit? Um, one being the difference between the income the government spends and the income it receives every year, and, to, and one being just the total amount of money that the government owes, and there's um, lots of confusion in the media about, about this. We are actually quite pleasantly surprised, around about 8 in 10 got the right answer, um, which may be better than some of our leaders, um, <laughs> as you can see, uh, getting the wrong way round and lots of debate about the use and misuse of statistics. Hi. But it's one thing understanding what the words mean and the definition is, and then another when we're trying to kind of work out what that really means in practice, what that might mean um, for some public services. So when we also said, do you know whether this statement is true, the national debt will always go down if the deficit is decreasing. Um, with the answer is false, good, okay, I'm seeing some shaking heads. And you're around about half are able to answer that correctly. And there's no difference at all in, the, in whether the people who got the definition, earlier definitions right or not. And they're still just as likely to get this wrong. So you can see there's kind of confusion around that. So okay, as I said, maybe this is being a little bit unfair. You know, these, are, you know, these are not top issues for most people. We're understanding what the debt and deficit is. We're not expecting everybody to have an economics A level. But there's also some worrying signs when we go into some real kind of basic building blocks around understanding of numbers and, and statistical literacy, as you'll see, um, most people get reasonably simple questions correct. Given the audience, I'm not going to ask you all to shout out the numbers. Um, uh, 9 in 10, say that, know that 50 is 25% of 200. Uh, 7 in 10 are able to say that 10 is the average of those three numbers. Uh, not to get into any debates about medians or modes or anything like this at this stage, please. Um, <laughs> But real difficulties with probabilities, which we've seen before. So what's the probability of getting two heads if you spin a coin twice? Only one in four get the right answer. And given the importance of probabilities today, and so they affect so much of our lives, and affect so much of our lives, you, know, you could argue that's a real uh, concern. I don't know if people were if people were pleasantly surprised or worried about that answer. Mm, okay, I've got some more worrying ones later on for you. This one. Um, yeah, exactly as we'd expect. Um, big relationships with education, but also other differences by age and actually noticeably as well. And it's not just about understanding the real basics of what numbers and statistics and percentages really mean, and, and what that might mean for kind of public understanding of discourse um, in the media around um, economics, around national policy. 
But as we uh, all know, I'm sure being avid readers of um, uh, Kahneman and others, we know that there are biases when we're considering um, statistics, which again we've just tried to pull out in some of this research that we've done for the RSS. So the personal optimism bias. Uh, what do you think the chance of probability is of either an unnamed person being injured or killed in a road accident, or you being injured or killed in a road accident? Not surprisingly, perhaps, uh, people are, got the actual numbers there, much more likely to think someone else will be injured in a road accident than they will, because you know, bad things don't happen to us. On the other hand, we've got a slightly different finding when we give people information in slightly different ways. So imagine you have a life-threatening illness and your doctor has told you that you need an operation to treat it. Uh, how likely are you to have this operation if your doctor tells you, first of all, that 90% of people who have the operation are alive for at least five years following the operation? Uh, well, we're quite likely. We kind of think that's quite good. Um, very different if we just give people exactly the same information, but the other way around. 10% of the people who have this operation die within five years. Uh, throughout you know, an increase in don't knows, unsure, we're not quite sure, don't quite like the sound of that. Has big implications for how policies are framed, how they're discussed in the media, um, for just dealing with members of the public around, you know, even something as basic as this. Um, so probably we should all be worried about this, but to what extent do people themselves are like, concerned about this? I mean, none of us, none of us would be arguing for for government by opinion poll or government by focus group, but should better use of evidence be being made use uh, being made use? No, it makes sense. Should there be better use of evidence um, in policy making? We ask people this: Where would you place yourself? Should Politicians, do you think politicians base their decisions more on what they think is right or more on the evidence? And around half say politicians uh, base their decisions more on what they think is right than on the evidence. What would be interesting to ask, and maybe we'll do next time, is to, is to find out what they think is the right answer. Mm. What should they be doing on that? But not a great belief the evidence is playing a very large role in politicians' decisions. But kind of maybe that's not surprising. Again, we've got to go back to people's daily lives. How do people really live their lives um, in the world out there when they're kind of not thinking about some of these kind of great deep issues? And it reflects their own feelings about how they make their own minds up about issues of national policy, about social policy and so on. Um, around about half, once again, say that their experience and those of their family and friends are more important than statistics to help them keep track of how the government is doing. And we know that there are great debates about the use of statistics and the way that it, they are kind of, uh, used and maybe cherry-picked by different parties and that ha unfortunately has an impact on public understanding um, and trust in some of these issues. And it may also reflect uh, a wider issue, perhaps, in our society. We we're trying to get an idea of, you know, to what extent do people value ability with numbers? Is it important for them? Um, do they think it's something that should be rewarded? Should it be recognised? We started off by asking, how would you feel? Would you feel embarrassed about admitting to friends or family that you're not very good with numbers or you're not very good with reading or writing? Now, we could take it. Actually, you know, most people, three and four people. So they be, wouldn't be embarrassed about admitting either. Maybe that just sort of shows us sort of a, a healthy society that we you know we're not trying to keep these things up inside ourselves. But certainly, we would be more embarrassed about admitting that we're not very good at reading or writing than we would be to admitting that we're not very good with numbers. Um, and it's even more stark on this question: um, which would make you most proud if your child was very good at numbers? or if your child was very good at reading or writing, at reading and writing. 13% say they'd be most proud if their child was very good at numbers. 
four times that, say they would be most proud if their child was very good at reading or writing. So again, maybe that's indicative of the way in which um, some statistics, some kind of discussion and, and use around statistics is, is used at the moment. Um, but certainly, potential worries there. So then it is worth asking, well, what does that mean then? If we've got some of this, if, if we think that some of these perceptions are being based on you know, a bit of shaky ground when it comes to either understanding of concepts or just understanding of some of the statistics and, and, and numbers that underpin those concepts, um, what might that mean for discussion and understanding around some of the public policy issues that I talked about right at the very beginning? So let's start with, with one key one, um, which is immigration. So. You saw there was a rise in concern in, in immigration over time from that earlier slide that I showed you. Um, and it's very, very clear. Three in four think that the number of people coming to live in the UK from other countries is too high. You know, there's, I'm not going to get into debate about that. There's lots of legitimate concerns that, that, that drive much of that um, worry uh, amongst members of the, the public. We can't just sort of simply dismiss it. Um, but it's also clear that at least partly it's based on an overestimation of the scale and impact of immigration in this country. So when we ask people what proportion of the UK population do you think are immigrants to this country, the medium was 26%, which is twice the actual proportion. But kind of we've seen that sort of finding before. I mean, it's not surprising, and we, and we know because uh, there's similarly huge overestimations of, of the amount of teenage pregnancies, for example. And um, so, what we try to do in this research is just get a little bit more of a deeper understanding about why people think that. And so, everyone who who uh, kind of got it wrong, basically overestimated it. We followed up. Um, oh, I'll, I'll show you this. Sorry, just before we get into this, um, the, the other interesting thing I want to say is that this is not. Uh, at all unusual. So the, we, this is based on some international research that's been done. Um, so if there, there are, if there was any country here underneath the line, it would imply that they were over uh, underestimating the proportion uh, of immigrants in their country and their aunts, basically. Every single country, and a whole range of different countries there with you know, very different uh, experiences and cultural attitudes to, towards immigration. Everybody overestimates it. So, come back to it. We wanted to understand why people believe that, that immigration is much higher than it actually is. Um, and so, if, if people overestimated it, we told them. We said, actually, you're wrong. Um, the proportion is 13%. So, why did you think it was much higher? And the responses were quite interesting. First of all, quite a lot of people just said, oh, I don't believe the figure that you're giving me. Then we got to people saying, well, it was the impact of uh, local experiences, family experiences. Then we have probably the honest people, so one in four saying, actually, I was just making it up. Um, and, then the inf and then sort of the influence of, of, of media coverage as well. So all those things having an impact on these perceptions. Um, another big issue at the moment, uh, you know, areas for cuts. And whenever we ask this question, which area do you think should be sort of be a highest priority for cutting public spending? Always see overseas aid coming out of the top, and, and and it may be partly because that's that's an overestimation of how much money is currently spent by the government on overseas aid. So we ask people, you know, what areas do you think the government spends the most money on? And if we kind of reorder that by how much is actually spent on each of those areas, you can see both on interest payments and overseas aid, people are relatively more likely to think we spend money on that and downplay how much is spent on state pensions. We see the biggest difference on perceptions of benefit fraud, where we ask people out of every 100 pounds how much is spent, uh, how much is, is claimed fraudulently, people guess 20 pounds, the actual <laughs> answer is 70p. So you can see the kind of obvious implications there for what that means with policy, but again, it's about trying to understand um, what that actually means and when we had a follow-up the follow-up question was quite useful quite insightful on this so you know most people were thinking about real fraud so faking disabilities or cash in hand or something some things are maybe on the borderline of fraud um, so not trying as hard as you might do to find work um, 
but some things which are very clearly not fraud, um, so just people having more children so they're entitled to more benefits, that's not fraud. That's, you know, it's people thinking they shouldn't be allowed to claim benefits for this, but it's not fraud, it's a misunderstanding there. Okay, so I'm gonna, gonna finish off now, but I'm, gonna, I'm sure you're all thinking, you know, that lovely uh, man from Ipsos Mori and poor old Alison, um, all the statisticians here, we're doing all this work, um, and uh, you know, what's it based on? Uh, what's the point? So I kind of want to reassure you on a slightly more, take a slightly more optimistic note that um, we do have an absolutely robust model for predicting the future, in particular um, uh, voting uh, in uh, general elections um, that's been tried time and time again and has got an amazing success rate. Um, we call it our sweet FA prediction model, which tells you um, that the election result is decided by the colour of the home strip of the holders of the FA Cup at the time of the election, where uh, if it's red or yellow, then Labour will win the election, um, or blue or white, the Conservatives will win the election. So I just want to take, as you can see, this is kind of got great heritage going back to the 50s. Um, one wrong answer, it was so sensitive that actually when there were two elections in 1974, it correctly predicted the hung parliament, and then the follow-up uh, uh, after Liverpool won it in May, uh, got that, got Labour right there too. Um, did get it wrong in 1983, but uh, only because Brighton missed the penalty in the dying seconds of the first <laughs> final, otherwise it would have been spot on once again. Um, and unfortunately did get it wrong in 2010. Um, however, um, our polls were spot on in 2010, so uh, maybe there was still something to be said for that. Um, thank you very much. Right, well thank you um, from me too for inviting me here today. I'm going to take a slightly different tack from Gideon, really focusing on, on one particular survey um, that Natsin has been carrying out since 1983 and, and showing um, what that shows us about some of the ways in which Britain's changing over time. Um, before I want to do that though, I just want to sort of take a halt and just say a little bit about measuring attitudes, why we do it, um, why it's important, how we do it. Um, so just to kick off on that front, I mean, you know, I would say this, wouldn't I? Obviously, I think that it's really important that we understand society um, and how it works and how it's changing. And I see attitudinal research as being a really key part of that. One of the really common objections when the British Social Attitude Survey was first introduced in 1983 was that attitudinal research was too soft. There was much better, harder research that was being done that really focused predominantly on people's behaviour, what they did rather than what they said. So a very common response to a lot of attitudinal research is, well, you know, people will say anything, it's what they do that really matters. And I'll come back to that as I go through this, just to give you a few illustrations of why um, I disagree with that point of view. Even if people don't always say, sorry, even if people don't always do what they say, I think it's still important to know what they think and to know about that in a very robust way. Um, Gideon referred earlier on, that was fascinating research, sort of looking at public perceptions of policy making and the extent to which it's based on evidence. Clearly, knowing what the public think about a particular issue, even if that's not going to drive actual policy decisions, is really important if you're going to think about how policy is best introduced. Um, and, and later on we can talk perhaps if you're interested in some examples of how that happens. And the second two bullet points here really refer to what would happen if we didn't do this sort of research, if attitudinal research didn't really exist. You'd get massive complete, competing claims about what the public think, and to some extent that goes on already. Um, but I think if you don't have robust representative research, you get people saying, I know what the public think and they think this. You don't really get an opportunity to hear robust evidence from the public themselves. And the people whose voices you hear the most, of course, are people in power, politicians, people with ready access to the media. So it's really important, I would argue, as part of the sort of democratic process to know what the public think about key issues. Obviously, attitudes can be really hard to measure, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you in this room are, are very aware of some of the common pitfalls, so I'm not going to go into a big lecture about that now. But some key things that we really need to think about when you're seeing some of the sorts of findings that get reported in the press, um, on television and so on, is really obvious questions about who's asking the question, you know, who's funding this piece of research, why are they doing it? I, I'm personally still incredulous at the amount of coverage that what I'd see is fairly sort of puff PR research. 
manages to get in some newspapers. So surveys that are totally unrepresentative, based on a you know a group of people who choose to write into a magazine, give their response to a fairly biased question. So I think that's the really key thing that's always worth bearing in mind. Um, how is the research being carried out? You know, is it based on a representative sample? Where did the sample come from? Is it an online panel that was recruited specifically for it? Is it people simply responding to a magazine article? There's, there's all sorts of ways in which um, research can be carried out, and clearly some are much, much more valid and robust than others. A really key issue, I think, is recognising that attitudes are complicated. You're never, ever going to get to the bottom of the public view on a particular issue by asking one question. And we all know that the way, the wording that we use in questions has an acute impact on how people respond to some of them. So obviously, you're going to want to look at questions in convoy. You know, don't rely on just one question. And I, I think, I'm sure Gideon would agree with me on that as well. And then the two sort of final caveats, really, are, I think illustrated really well by what Gideon said as well as I hope by what I say. So firstly the value of time series. So the value of having a sort of data bank that goes back over decades where you've asked the same question in exactly the same way over time and you can look at how the public view is changing. There are disadvantages to that and I'll, I'll come on to that slightly later on but on the whole that can be fantastic evidence about how public opinion is shifting and amongst which groups. And then finally the insight that you get from looking at other countries. So it's very easy when you're only looking at the UK to get very focused on UK specific reasons for changes. Being able to put that into a cross-national context, again as, as Gideon showed really clearly, is incredibly helpful because it helps you get a sense of what factors might be unique to your own country and what factors are part of something much bigger that's affecting a range of other countries as well. Um, before showing you some findings from the British Social Attitude Survey, just to give you some really key information about it for those of you who don't know it. So it's an annual survey that began back in 1983. It was initiated by NATSEN, then SCPR, and has been carried out by us ever since. Um, it covers a really, really wide range of different topic areas, politics, welfare, gender roles, religion, very, very wide range of topics. There's a real emphasis on trying to repeat questions over time, but trying to balance that with bringing in new questions to make sure it's up to date and covering key new issues. 3,000 plus adults randomly selected from the postcode address file across Britain, gets funding from a variety of different sources, including government departments, charities and grant giving bodies um, and then every year well more than once a year but every year we publish a, a large digital report that goes into some of the key findings um, and our next report is coming out next tuesday and will be available online free so do look out for that so what i'm going to do now is just talk through two examples of areas in which britain now looks very different to britain back in the early to mid 1990s when the survey began. I'm going to start off talking about what I've called here social liberalism, and I'm then going to move on to look at attitudes towards welfare, which ties in very nicely with some of the Ipsos RSS work that Gideon mentioned. So starting off with social liberalism, um, we have a, a series of questions of which these are just a, reflect, uh, a small selection, looking at people's views about different sorts of personal relationships, different sorts of um, sexual behaviour. So this first line on the graph, that shows the proportion of people who take the view that premarital sex is almost always or mostly wrong. So now you can see it stands at just over 10%. Um, back in 1983, it was around three. Th sorry, back in 1983, it was 30%. So there's been a decline, quite a sort of marked decline over time. Um, gradually, year on year, tends to get slightly lower. If you then lay over the top of that, this is the proportion of people who take the same view, but this time um, in relation to sexual relations between two adults of the same sex. Um, so here you can see that now. Um, just looking at it, it's about 30 odd percent who take the view that um, sexual relations between two adults of the same sex is almost always or mostly wrong. And again here you see this picture of increase in tolerance. The things that are worth pointing out here 
Um, firstly, it's a much steeper line than the line in relation to views about premarital sex. The other thing that's interesting here is it shows you about the importance of context. So you'll notice that from around 60% back in 1983, um, intolerance, if you like, towards homosexuality increased, and I'm sure all of you can, can guess at least part of the reason for this, which is that during the 1980s you've got massive concern about the impact of HIV AIDS, you've got the Don't Die of Ignorance government public health campaign, etc, etc. So you actually, in, in the decade of the 1980s, you see um, growing intolerance of um, homosexuality, but it's declined very, very steeply um, since then. Doesn't mean anything goes. What we found is that irrespective of what people say, sorry, irrespective of what people do, people are as critical now as they were back in the 1980s of people who are married having sex outside marriage. Um, if you're interested in looking at this in more detail, there is a chapter looking at these issues um, in our report that comes out next week. So do have a look at that. Um, the key point I'd like to make about these findings is that they're a really, really good example of what we in the trade call generational change. So basically, each generation that is born is slightly more liberal and tolerant on these views than the generation before it. And so gradually, slowly, over time, society becomes more liberal and tolerant because the older generations with these less tolerant views gradually die out and get replaced by younger generations who have more tolerant views about these sorts of issues. Um, very, very similar pattern if you look at religious identification. So if you, if you plotted religious identification over time, you'd see gradually, gradually, the proportion of people who say that they belong to a particular religion has declined. Um, and again, it's this same generational pattern. So just reflecting on that, um, and I suppose trying to address the so what, you know, of course people are more liberal now than they were back in 1983. Um, I would argue that this sort of research is helping us understand really clearly how, what people think about different sorts of sexual relationship and get a really clear handle on how this is changing over time and why. Obviously, it's a very, very different climate now to the one that we were in in the early 1980s when there was this concern about HIV AIDS that I mentioned before. And clearly, it's impossible back then to imagine discussions about same-sex marriage in the way that we're now having. So clearly, society has changed massively. Um, the other key example of, of how this these sorts of statistics are useful. It's really this issue about understanding how groups vary. So for example, is it the case, I mentioned earlier that there's been a decline in the proportion of people who would define themselves as religious. Does that explain the sort of change we found? No, it doesn't. Even if you look at people who are religious, they too have become more liberal and tolerant on these sorts of views over time. So what's happening here is something that, as I mentioned, is very much linked to generational change. It's a slow, steady process. And in the absence of something kind of unforeseen and, and huge in the way that HIV AIDS was, um, it's kind of hard to imagine that society is going to go back to how it was 20 or 30 years ago. It's very, very likely that we'll carry on becoming slightly more liberal and tolerant on these sorts of issues as time goes by. Um, very different picture when you look at attitudes to welfare. So this is something that there's been a lot of um, work done using British Social Attitudes data on welfare and a lot of discussion about what it means. So I'm going to give you a very, very quick flavour of that. And again, there's a chapter in our report next week if you're interested in seeing the sort of updated figures. Um, what I'm showing you here is a response to a question that asks people to think about unemployment benefit levels. Um, we give people a number of options, and I'm showing two on the, the graph here. So the purple line is the proportion of people who take the view that unemployment benefits are too low and cause hardship. And the green line is the proportion of people who take a different view, which is that unemployment benefits are too high um, and put people off finding work. And what you can see here really clearly is that in the period from 1983 right up until 1997, the purple line was the dominant one. So more people thought that unemployment benefits were too low than thought they were too high. Then you can see that after 1997, there's a really, really considerable change. And the picture has largely reversed. And that gap 
in fact, between those who think benefits are too high and those who think they're too low, is growing. So you now have a situation where over 60% back in 2011, which is the most recent data for this, thought benefit levels were too high. This is during a period of considerable austerity and concern about unemployment as well, uh, whereas only 20% took the view that benefit levels were too low. The other thing that's interesting about this is that on this measure, as with many others, um, people tend to become more sympathetic towards unemployment benefit recipients and more demanding to see more spent on, on welfare benefits during periods of recession. And what we've found is that this hasn't happened with the most recent recession. There's no evidence at all. You can see quite clearly that, in fact, the period from 2009 onwards the proportion of people who think benefits are too high has actually gone up year on year rather than going down. Now, okay, you could say that's just one question. You know, don't practice what you preach. Don't, don't rely on one question before making these kinds of claims. So what I'm going to do now is just overlay data from a series of different questions just to show you how this pattern, this change over time, with a particular change that really seemed to happen in the 1990s, um, is true irrespective of which particular question you're looking at. So this um, first line here is showing the proportion of people who'd like to see more government um, spending on welfare benefits for the poor. And what you can see here very clearly is that there's been quite a considerable decline over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, so that now stands at 28%, taking that view down from 55% uh, from back in 1987, which was the first time that we asked it. I've then laid on here um, responses to a different question, which is looking at, sorry, the thing's cut off at the top. This is basically a response to a question asking whether or not government should redistribute income from the better off to the less well off. Now, here the, the, um, the decline, if you like, is not so sharp, but you can still see that there's this very steep decline in the 1990s, starting in about 1994 and going all the way down to the sort of turn of the century. Um, that mirrors very much the earlier um, question that I asked about, that I mentioned, sorry. We then lay on um, one of the questions I, I was looking at earlier on. So this, again, shows this proportion of people who think that unemployment benefits are too high and put people off finding work. Now at 62%, up from a low of 24% back in 1993. Um, and as I mentioned, up from a from 54% back in 2010. And again here you can see that there's this, that figure went up considerably during the late 1990s at a point where um, the desire to see more spending on these groups was going down very considerably. Oops. And then finally, this is quite a strongly worded statement that we ask people whether they agree or disagree with, um, that ben if benefits were less generous, people would stand on their own feet. Um, and that now stands at 54% of people agreeing with that statement, up from a low of 25% back in 1993. So across a range of different questions, it seems very clear that Britain is now far less amenable to and supportive of welfare provision and sort of active redistribution of, of, of income and wealth than it was back in the 1980s when we first started asking these questions. And we can obviously have a huge debate about what's driving that. There are all sorts of issues that clearly will play a part. There's definitely an issue about public perception. We know that people vastly overestimate the proportions of people who, who fraudulently claim benefits. We know that people also vastly overestimate the amount of money that's spent on welfare relative to other areas of government spending. However, I think it is fair to say that there's definitely something going on in the 1990s, which is a point at which a lot of people really started changing their mind, if you like, about benefit and the impact of um, unemployment benefits in particular on, on their recipients. And one of the um, quite interesting areas of work that's been done has basically pointed towards the key role amongst the Labour Party in changing the way that they talked about benefits prior to and particularly when they came into office in 1997. And if you look at these sorts of um, 
questions and you, you break them down by whether or not someone's a Labour Party supporter or a Conservative Party supporter, you do indeed see that whereas in the, in the 1980s there was this enormous gulf between the views of Labour Party and Conservative Party supporters, that gulf has shrunk quite considerably over the, the intervening period and particularly during this key period in the 1990s. So reflections on that. Um, why, what does that add to the debate? What, how is this helpful to us? Clearly it opens up a debate about how Britain is changing and, and how Britain thinks about this very key area of government policy. Certainly findings like these and, and findings from, from many other sources have helped government feel confident that they are pushing in the right direction when it comes to some of their areas of welfare reform. Um, we're not necessarily saying that people are right to hold the views they do. And clearly, as, as we've mentioned, there are, there are questions over how well informed people are. But it is really important that we do understand what people think and we understand the things that are driving that. Um, it's also worth saying that this is an area where looking at it cross-nationally is fascinating because you can look at how people's attitudes towards welfare vary depending on the kind of welfare regime within the particular country in question. <laughs> and you find, for example, um, that in countries that have more generous welfare regimes, people actually tend to be slightly more generous towards welfare recipients and less concerned about fraud. Fraud does seem to be um, a peculiarly British obsession. Um, the third point there is just really trying to understand who, how groups vary and the, the important um, clues that that can give us as to why views are changing. And I mentioned earlier on um, the importance of being able to look at party political supporters and how their views differ and how that's changed over time. Um, and then finally, it's worth saying this, this is a really good example of a different sort of factor that underpins change. So earlier on I <coughs> talked about people's views about personal relationships and how we've basically moved in a more socially liberal, tolerant direction. And this has been a really, really gradual um, process over a long period of time driven by generational change. This is completely different. This isn't driven by generational change. This is driven by a key change that happened in the 1990s and has continued um, since then. And it's a good example of how um, context matters. So people's views about these things are shaped by context. There's a huge debate to be had about what that context means in reality. It's partly <laughs> to do with the media, it's to do with politicians, it's to do with policy and how we talk about these things. But clearly um, this, like attitudes towards public spending more generally, is an example of how public opinion is, is cyclical is probably the wrong word, but it's very responsive to what's actually going on in the public realm, even though, as Gideon mentioned, these aren't things people necessarily think about every day of their lives. So just to conclude, um, attitudes matter. It's really important that we know what people think and that we know what people think in a sort of very robust and representative way. They can be hard to measure, although frankly so too can behaviour. I mean, I don't know if anyone here works in survey research, but the idea that behaviour is easy to, to measure is, is, is a nonsense. Um, but, you know, attitudes are tricky too, but it is a worthwhile thing to do. And surveys like British Social Attitudes hold up a sort of very good mirror as to how Britain is changing. Um, and I've given you a couple of examples today, firstly looking at tolerance and social liberalism, and secondly looking at attitudes to welfare, and really showing the different sorts of factors that underpin um, why we're changing and how. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Yeah, um, Alison made the point at the end that the change in attitudes to welfare wasn't due to generational effect, but, but is there an age effect? In, in other words, if you look at it, you know, how it varies with age, I just wondered if yes. the young felt differently from the older. Yes, I mean, on, on a lot of issues, well, there are, I suppose there's two parts to my, my response. Yes, on a lot of those issues, there, there will be age effects whereby young people will feel differently to older ones. Um, and, and to some extent, that will be driven by life cycle, by life stages. So, for example, the most obvious one would be people become more interested and engaged with debates about pensions as they get older and possibly less interested in discussions about childcare and education. Um, it, it really will depend on the topic that you're looking at. On some issues, older people are actually less um, 
supportive of welfare provision than young people on, on other issues younger people are than older. Other questions or comments? If you could say who you are as well when... Yeah, uh, Paul Laskey. Um, I'm just really interested, I guess, what, what we've heard there is a description across a wide scope of issues. Um, and across that wide scope, uh, very large gaps between perception and reality. And, and those issues cross lots of boundaries. I'm just really wondering where you think sort of the national ownership might lie in terms of trying to bridge that gap somehow. The national ownership of what? Of, of uh, how that gap gets bridged between the perception and reality, given that it's across all dimensions, social attitudes, health, education, you know, the examples there we've heard around uh, pregnancy benefit and that sort of thing. That gap is significant and it's wide ranging. And just where, how is that gap going to get filled? So where do we look for the ownership on that mm. in a sort of centralised sort of way perhaps? So, Gideon, do you want to kick off? Is there anybody yeah. that can help? I mean, I mean I mean, the, uh, the, you know, there's a kind of the answer to something is everybody. I mean, you know, of course, it, it lies with everybody. Um, I, uh, you know, I was, I was slightly overplaying for for, for, uh, for exaggerating some some of the differences. I mean, you, you can equally look at things that do show a kind of a very uh, what seem like a very real and very believable change that that does reflect uh, reality. Um, you can look at, for example, um, satisfaction with the health service, which kind of clearly went up during the late 90s and early 2000s mm. as lots of extra money was spent on it. Um, for some of the, you know, when we're doing uh, um, much less um, exciting research, um, but arguably just as important for people's quality of life for local councils, for example, you know, you, you, you can see. Um, you, know, you consistently get findings, for example, about what is important to people are kind of issues around sort of livability and sort of street scene and clean, safe, green type areas, and you feed that back to the council, and the council puts money into improving its street cleaning operation, and then you sort of you see that feeding through into perceptions as perceptions improve. So I'm slightly can slightly overplay um, some of that. So I think there are lots of uh, kind of real examples. The other thing I would say is. Um, to some extent, clearly the, the kind of the responsibility it lies on politicians, it lies on media, it maybe it, it lies upon all of us as members of the public to be aware of some of our, con you know, as um, Alison said, kind of we it's very complex. People have lots of contradictions in their own views, and we sort of, you know, we want everything, you know, we want a, everyone wants a free lunch, um, you know, we want taxes low, we want services high, we want everyone to be very friendly. Um, and open and welcoming, um, but also the same colour as us. And you know, I mean, it's kind of exaggerating, but that, so that we have these contradictions. So to some of it, some of it, sent it lies upon us. But the last thing I was going to say is that actually understanding those misperceptions is quite useful because it might sometimes point to the fact that um, I'll put it another way, the response. I don't think the response should always be you're wrong, member of the public. Um, you've got the wrong facts, you need to change your mind. Um, sometimes that's true, but sometimes it shows that the public has a different, you know, if you're trying to force the public to follow what you as a policymaker thinks you have to, you have what they should be thinking, it's quite dangerous and you can find some interesting findings. Um, so the kind of a traditional one is about kind of concern about crime um, and one argument, you know, there's always the kind of the findings about well, you know, people are really worried about crime, and yet official figures for for crime are, are going down. But one of the interesting arguments um, that can be made, I don't know if it, how completely, how much I believe it, but there's, I think there's some truth in it, is that when this was happening during the 90s, Tony Blair picked up on it, and he felt maybe what it's under it's suggesting is it's just a mismatch, and what the public are thinking about are sort of low ASB type. Levels and that, and they're sort of expressing that concern through a fear of crime. So what they're not worried, then they say they're worried about crime. They're not necessarily thinking about um, uh, burglary and violent crime and so on. But they're sort of expressing a concern about something that is important to them about sort of low levels of, of antisocial behaviour. And so therefore, being able to do something about that was, in, was important. Mm. Alison. Um, yes, I mean. 
just to back up Gideon's point, I think there are areas where it's very clear that public attitudes track real spending. So, for example, we've got a standard question we've asked for 30 years on attitudes towards taxation and spending. And it's, um, it's, it's fascinating how sort of cyclical it is. So when spending is tight and being constrained, people proportion of people who want to see spending go up increases and then when spending's relaxed so for example under the Labour government the proportion of people want to see more spending goes down so I think I, that's just to back up Gideon's initial point that we're not saying that people are completely kind of um, divorced from the reality um, I mean one one thing that I think has been really useful and I'd, I'd be interested in the sort of RSS view on this is the the rise of the kind of fact checky type mm. organizations so for example is it full fact, full fact yeah. so organizations like full fact that will really take newspapers particular organizations the Prime Minister to task for misrepresenting statistics now the challenge then I think for all of us who are interested in this is the fact that that's only going to reach certain people you know you look back at that first slide of Gideon's about the proportion of people well, it was more looking at why people read the newspaper, but actually over 30 years, newspaper readerships declined massively. So you've got organisations, amongst those who are engaged and interested, I think there are now really important organisations that are reaching out and saying, no, that's wrong, it's nonsense, the immigration statistics look like this. The key then is how do you get the people who don't read that sort of thing and don't watch that kind of programme or listen to that? And it, I mean, it can be argued that that sort of fact-checking stuff has an impact on that audience as well, because, for example, when people know that they're being watched, they will True. Yeah. you know, roll back on the level of falsehood that they're willing to commit. So mm. there's a kind of watchdog effect there that's yeah. quite important, I think. So uh, certainly I think the RSS view is that you've got to build the institutional capability. It can't just all be down to the individual. Mm. I mean, the idea that, uh, I mean, um, Eric Pickles has the idea of the armchair auditor kind of make all data transparent and then we at, we at the individual level will be sort of doing all this data analysis at home is patently untrue. But we rely on a whole set of uh, organisations, which magazine at the kind of consumer level mm. or full fact or others to be sort of doing that data analysis for us. So if there are trusted organisations that can do that on our behalf, uh, I think that's very important. <coughs> yeah, my name's Graham Neal. Um, a few years ago, before the most recent Statistics Act, I think there was some kind of assessment of the trust that people had in official statistics. And I have this number in my head of something like 55% did not believe, in general, official statistics. And I wonder if this sort of mismatch between the facts, the official statistics, and what people believe is partly a lagged effect of that kind of mistrust. Uh, and it's I mean, okay, we've got a new app now, but it's taking some time to come into effect. People don't necessarily follow up on that. They don't. They, they still see politicians misusing or misquoting or misapplying statistics, and gradually that might change. But um, has there been any more recent assessment of the extent to which people believe official statistics? Um, is there some gets us? Yeah. I, well, my understanding is that. Um, th there's some planned, the Stats Authority has written it into its plan, I think, for next year to do some, some work on that. Um, I mean, interestingly, of course, because first Michael Scholar and then Andrew Dilnot have been quite vociferous in slapping down politicians, actually you might find that increases mistrust because it's uh, yeah. in the public awareness, as it were. So uh, the relationship in these things can be quite complicated, I think. I think we, well, we certainly did some of that research and it's quite back in the uh, mid 2000s, whenever it was, um, uh, I, I suppose kind of this, this sort of two things. One is which some of our regular tracking questions on on trust in various professions um, has shows that um, I don't know if this is good or bad for for trust in, in statistics, but um, that uh, trust in sort of some professions like scientists. Um, is actually on, on the up. Trust in sort of civil servants is, is on the up, even whilst trust in sort of politicians and journalists is kind of down there with the state agents. Um, and um, po polling firms, don't polling firms. Well. No, 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 we don't. No, but we're, we're, we're above politicians, and we do put polling firms. I think we're good for putting polling firms in there. Um, but um, yes, uh, uh, so I don't know if, they, if that suggests you know, maybe some some positive signs. Um, 
but yeah, certainly, I mean, there's so much kind of debate, and as you saw in that question about um, immig you know, immigration statistics, you know, a response for a number of people mm -hmm. is, is just to say, no, I don't think these are known there. Over their statistics, you can argue about them probably, but you know, some responses are, I just don't believe it. Don't, don't believe it, it doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense yeah. to me. I don't, it doesn't fit with my, my narrative. So I think that is concerning. And when there's also so much debate about uh, the right thing to do for, for GDP growth and, and so on and on economic policy, I think it does make people worried. Mm. I mean, I think with, with tr trust and confidence in statistics, you're also up against that, that point that I think we've both made about this not being an area mm -hmm. which people have at front of mind and really mm -hmm. know very much about. And I suspect there is a very kind of hazy perception of the, the, the distinction between official statistics and politicians, and we know that trust in politicians and government has declined enormously over the last 30 years, and I think to some extent it's going to be a casualty of that sort of decline, particularly amongst, I mean, on, on political trust, I, th I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Gideon, but it's the, the, the lowest levels of trust are found amongst the least well-educated. Um, yes. And yes. so... I suspect that will play through into people's perceptions and views about statistics too. Good. Uh, so, uh, Ian Vernon, um, just the areas where people are, uh, say, misinformed, you, you've touched on uh, several. Uh, what are the patterns between these areas? So, you, you gave the example where uh, people are quite well informed about the sort of NHS. Uh, however, in areas such as crime, immigration, there are quite uh, a bit of uh, misinformation. What is the pattern? Are these just areas which are dramatic? to talk about in the media? Is there something more subtle going on? Is it an education problem? Are there any links between these, these areas? Where, where does the public have a grip on reality and where not? <laughs> Um, I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't. I wouldn't say the public are particularly well informed on the tax and spend issue that I mentioned earlier. I think the point I was trying to make was more that um, public opinion doesn't exist in a vacuum, and that it's very responsive. It is responsive to the context. Um, you know, I mean, certainly from the viewpoint of British Social Attitudes work we've done, immigration and welfare are probably the two of the key areas where the gap between perception and reality is, is very large. Um, on issues like the NHS, um, I suppose in, to some extent more people are going to come into daily contact, or not daily contact, but regular contact with the health service um, and know people who have and so might be slightly more informed um, there's a classic finding about the NHS, isn't there, that people tend to rate their personal experience of it pretty yeah. well, mm -hmm. but when asked about it at the national level, say it's in crisis. So mm -hmm. yeah. there is something about the gap yeah. between... So GPs are always great, yes. but the yes. NHS as a whole is... That's why I wondered if this is, a lot of this is from sort of media reporting and whatnot. Obviously it's dramatic to report that crimes are bad and hospitals are bad. It's not so dramatic to report that hospitals have been all right again this week. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that there's. I mean, as um, Hitan said, there's definitely a, a difference in the in the, the kind of the absolute classic of the, sort of the local and the national. I think the kind of the, mm -hmm. the most obvious pattern is you know what you have personal experience, you know, what you have personal experience of, and what you don't. And you can see that in immigration as well, and, and in crime actually as well. You know, exactly the same sort of pattern where you know, crime in my local area isn't too bad, yeah. um, but crime nationally we're going to the you know we're going to the dogs. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I mean, again, I, I suppose it's, uh, I'd just be ever so slightly wary about kind of writing off people's views on that, on that point of view, because there still may well be, um, you know, quite sincerely held views about concerns about the impact of, you know, we, we may not all agree with them, but they may be quite sincerely held views that are just reflecting people's value, you know, it's, it's a kind of a value, expression of value judgment, as much as a kind of comment on the current state of Things you know, there, there, there is a kind of you know, there is a concern, there is a kind of changing social values on, let us say, uh, attitudes towards welfare. Mm. There so is a, and sort of a changing set of priorities that people had, sort of similarly on uh, on immigration and maybe on, on social liberalism from the other point of view. And, and some of the expressions are kind of reflecting that concern um, and those changing sort of values as, as much as things. Clearly, the media has got a large part to play, but. I always feel it's sort of very easy just to say it's yeah. always the media, media's fault, yeah. as it were. Yeah. And there's a sense in which I think what you're saying is that the pe people aren't always answering quite the question that you're asking yeah. them. They're, they're using it to express a concern yeah. at a slightly deeper level. Yeah. Uh, that did come out in our yeah. research, I think. Yeah. Uh, just, just to add, I was going to ask, is it different, you know, 
areas where people's local experience is they're much better informed and clearly that's the case but also is it a bit like the housing it, it's not just the media it's actually all the experts so the, ha the constant, regular housing price bubbles that we have in this country the problem is if you're an economist nine out of ten economists sitting in the room will all say oh yes there's a housing price bubble but none of them will put their head above the water and say this is really bad and dangerous and it's got to stop otherwise we'll have another crash because that's not how their firm is going to then make money in the city <laughs> or wherever it's sitting and, and they might predict it's going to crash but they can't predict is it going to be this year or next year or the year after so therefore they very quickly look forward to if they put their hand up or as, as much as anything else and, and you know having said we shouldn't always invoke the media i'm about to invoke the media again um but you look at things like um the mmr debate and the way that uh, kind of a you know and you can see why it arises because it's about kind of showing a balanced view but always showing that the opposite view on MMR or on climate change, for example, when um, despite the fact that I mean, I'm not nobody near an expert on this, but what seems to be a kind of very clear majority support amongst climate change society, scientists um, on on the dangers, the public thinks that there's real debate um, mm. amongst the experts, and maybe exaggerates the extent to which there is debate amongst the experts on on some of these issues and, and so that kind of leads to more confusion again I mean you can kind of come at it from the other point of view and think about actually what are the issues that people I mean, we've been talking about maybe the issues that perhaps we think people are worried too much about what are the issues that people aren't worried enough about yeah. you know so it's interesting yeah. that housing isn't very hot you know no. or climate change housing or climate change are <laughs> arguably two absolutely massive mm. issues but they you know housing is on there and it is going up on my list my issues index list but it's not up there with mm. Um, NHS or crime or alone anywhere near economy or un unemployment and neither is climate change you know bum bubbling mm. along the ground and that might be more of an issue in a few years time. Yeah. One question I had Alison your your research on welfare was very interesting and, uh, and there's an argument that could have been made or that he's sometimes made that really it's you know the coalition recently has been doing down sort of welfare scrounging etc etc and in a sense, it's politicians who've led the public to sort of think that. But your research suggests that the change was happening much earlier. Yeah, it's earlier. not a recent thing. Um, There's a really so what's your sense of what was driving some of that? I mean, you started hinting at that, but yeah. could you say a bit more? Yes, I mean, to, to some extent, a, a great part of it seems to have begun in, not, not even in 97 when Labour re came into power, but before that. And so when those of you who will remember this time, there was a lot of debate about um, Labour's constitution, the meaning of Labour, what was old Labour, what was new Labour, and there, there does seem a sense that um, some of the changing stances of the Labour Party, particularly on issues like inequality and redistribution, I can't remember who made that quote about, I don't care if... We're intensely relaxed. Thank you, yes. thank you. Okay, I'm immensely yes. relaxed yes. about, yeah. Um, immensely relaxed about people becoming filthy, filthy rich, rich, just in case yeah. people haven't... Sort of trickle-down theory. Um, so some those sorts of discussions and debates appear to have had an impact um, both upon the public and as a whole and on Labour Party supporters in particular. Um, and then some of the policy changes that came in in the late 1990s, um, particularly about the sort of rights and responsibilities of benefit recipients, also seem to have had an impact. In terms of the media, I mean, I'd echo Gideon that it's, it's really easy to just blame it all on the mass media, but I mean, certainly... Um, it is worth, there was some really nice research done by Ben Baumberg, who's an academic at Kent, looking at um, the use of different terminology in relation to welfare benefit recipients and the rise of the scrounger. Um, that's, that's worth a look if you're interested in that sort of work and sort of plotting how terminology has changed in the debate. But certainly, you know, back in the 1990s, there were some pretty horrible words being used back then. They were slightly different, but they were there, so... The media, I think, does have a role. Well, I'm afraid time's come to wrap this fascinating session up. Uh, I'd uh, really like to thank both of our speakers for a very wide-ranging and interesting uh, insight into uh, what Britain is thinking and feeling. Particularly both came up on the train today and are both going back on the train today. Uh, so although we're small in number, quality is what counts. And I hope we've had a fascinating, interesting kind of debate. So uh, let's show our appreciation for our speakers. Today.